We're going to talk today a little bit about how cities and communities are better using digital technologies to engage residents. I think that, um, as we all know more than ever, cities are trying to increase the two-way dialogue they're having with communities, and technology is a big part of that. It's been a long and hard road for cities, as we know, and so we want to talk a little bit about what's working and where there continue to be areas for improvement, and how can those both within government and outside of it help to accelerate this movement. And we have a great panel. I'm going to quickly introduce them and then get right to it. Um, former Mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter, um, Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Sly James, Scott Schweitzberg, who leads City Voices at McKinsey, and Beth Blauer, the Executive Director of the Center for Government Excellence at Johns Hopkins University. Um, this group is among my favorite people, so I am excited. I will say that the topic and the panelists do not lend themselves to brief responses, so um, we're going to jump right in and try to do this in 40 minutes. So I'm going to start with just some bright spots. I would love for each of you to maybe start with saying a little bit more about who you are, but also just sharing your favorite example of a city using technology or using data, using technology, digital services to better engage residents. Beth, you want to start? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Beth Flower. I um, lead a initiative at Johns Hopkins University uh, called the Center for Government Excellence, where we have partnered with Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, and Results for America, and have uh, worked with over 100 cities, essentially uh, determining how ready they are to use data, and then providing them technical assistance for the use of that data. I think for me, the bright spot that I like to think about um, when I think about uh, resident engaged data use um, is um, during the most recent round of hurricanes that uh, hit Florida. Um, Mike Sarasi and the team at, um, at the city of Miami were able to very quickly deploy essentially resident data collectors uh, to gauge where flooding levels were because they had really easily uh, cheap tools that they were able to put on cell on uh, smartphones, and so they put triage teams out into the field, they divided the, the, team, the city into quadrants, um, and then residents were given an app where they were able to give real-time information on the levels of flooding that were happening. And that data that was uh, resident collected um, through the mechanisms of the city was by far the most um, uh, tactical data and the most strategic data um, in, in light of many, many, many millions of dollars invested um, in public monies towards emergency management. It happened to be one of the most tactical ways. And so the residents felt like they were um, making safe and smart decisions about um, their communities. They were getting good information back to their city and then the city was integrating it into the way that they were um, uh, uh, staffing their response. And so um, it's one of these examples where we can leverage technology that we already have in a city um, and create really uh, uh, very powerful, robust tools that can um, be there in the most uh, critical of moments. Thank you. That's great. Scott? Hi, I'm Scott Schweisberg. I lead City Voices, which is a solution from McKinsey designed to help uh, mayors and governors make better decisions by understanding both resident perception and objective performance metrics along the same sets of categories. Um, I think my favorite um, use of technology to engage residents is uh, maybe a little obvious, but it's um, Op opening up transit information, uh, making it available for things like Google Maps, I think that that has fundamentally transformed how people think about using transit and thinking about multimodal options for where they should go and how they should get there. Uh, I think what would be really exciting is if you started to see a feedback loop where the companies who then received that data started spitting back information about how people are using transit so we could then make better decisions about it. Uh, but I'll settle for the first half for now. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Sly James. I'm Michael Nuther's uh, better looking brother. <laughs> that wouldn't take much. You're a handsome man. Um, you know, the things that I like about the way that we use data in Kansas City is that everything that we do is geared towards making life for our citizens better. Um, it's nice to have the bells and whistles. It's nice to be at conferences like this. But the only reason to be here talking about this is to deliver services to the citizens of my city faster, more efficiently, and in a more cohesive and functional way. 
So when we have things like pothole predictors, water main predictors, uh, working towards predictive analytics with regards to crime, uh, those are things that have a real impact on people's lives. Uh, we are also one of those cities that really likes to look at the issue of equity. Now that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be totally transparent and honest with you, our city is still segregated in a lot of ways, but I would be willing to bet that I could talk to anybody in any city in this room, and your cities are too. I just know that ours is, and I don't like it. But one of the products of that segregation is the fact that we have a digital divide. And it does no good for half of the city to have access to digital and broadband infrastructure, and the other half not to. So one of the things that we've done, and the thing that I think is most important, is to make sure that whatever we are able to do on the positive side by using data, data collection techniques, uh, smart city technology, sensors, all of that, we're using everywhere so that the whole largesse can be shared. Because that's how you build a city, is making sure that you raise every single boat, not just the ones that have masks on them. Try to do two quick ones. I see the sign going on over there. So the old one is, um, Shortly after we came in uh, to office, now 10 years ago, um, crime was a significant issue. Crime is a, if you have more than one shooting or homicide, you have a significant issue. But we realized uh, using data uh, that 65% of the homicides uh, in our city were in a third uh, of the police districts. Uh, before that, of course, every district's about the same size and gets about the same number of officers. And we did a rebalancing uh, to put the officers, I mean, you don't have to be, you know, Inspector Clouseau to figure this out, uh, that we need to put the officers where the criminal activity was taking place, and saw significant reductions, even in our first year, into the second year, and ultimately a 31% reduction in homicides uh, in the city of Philadelphia during uh, my time. Taking an example from New York, it instituted a 311 system in the first year in office, didn't have all the bells and whistles, but we committed to having one, and it opened December 31st, 2008. Um, and you're getting much better information from citizens about uh, constituent service, constituent needs, especially uh, in severe weather events, uh, like, you know, 20 inches of snow. We, we said we thought our plows were over here, but we're getting massive complaints lighting up the board showing that we're actually not providing a high quality of service uh, in some places. And being able to capture all of that data in real time uh, helps you to better direct your forces in real time to provide real time services to citizens. Thank you, that's great. So it does seem like there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of great work happening. Um, Scott, maybe I'll start with you. You've been in City Hall and the Bloomberg administration and working with tech and consulting companies, so sort of been on both sides of the equation. I would love to hear from you and we'll have our other visionaries join in. What does the dream look like? There's obviously a lot of barriers. Um, but what does this look like to really be working well, to really be using these technologies to solve meaningful problems in cities? Um, I, that's a great question. I, I think there's a couple of pieces that you, that you want to try and get right. Uh, the first one is, um, in a dream scenario, uh, the, the policymakers and the practitioners and the operators already have um, fairly good, fairly timely visibility into what's actually happening. Uh, I think one of the challenges when we think about how um, we, we talk about engagement, a lot of times it's, it's kind of similar to what Marinetta was saying. It's about getting the facts on the ground from the people. Uh, but in a perfect system, we'd already have those facts. And then what we'd be looking to do with an engagement tool is understanding how are the facts on the ground actually affecting people and their happiness? And are we meeting their needs? Are we giving them what they want um, or not? Uh, and I think that's the second piece, is when you think about um, what we then want to do, I think the ideal scenario is a mix of both active and passive radar, right? We, we I think we've done a pretty good job through things like 311 uh, and being active on social media uh, and just being responsive when people show up in terms of catching the kind of active radar uh, answers, people who are mad enough to sort of raise their hand and say, I have a problem, I need you to go solve it. Uh, what would be really exciting is figuring out how to tap into kind of the passive radar. Uh, I, I personally do think that actually social media broadly is a good tool for that in terms of just getting people who aren't necessarily, don't care enough to necessarily call and 
and solve the problem through 311, but are just raising their hand and saying, hey, oh my god, the streets are terrible, or the trash wasn't picked up, or whatever these things are. How do we capture that and start to get a sense of what's actually happening and how people feel? Uh, because the perfect system says, we know what's going on. It is what we're doing today actually meeting the needs and desires of the people that are there. Uh, and if we can answer those questions, then we're doing a really great job. Great. Can other people add to the dream? Other thoughts? What? Simone, I'm sorry. Remind me. The, and the dream is? What, is this, what, dream what is? does it look like to really effectively use these technologies to address city challenges? And like, what are the cities of the future? Um, what could they look like? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I, again, I've been out, out, of, uh, out of office for a little while, but uh, my sense would be maybe this problem has not been completely solved back home, and I certainly didn't solve it, so I say that to, to start, uh, which is still old technologies, uh, legacy systems. I mean, I think there are probably still a couple governments around where maybe all of the equipment doesn't talk to each other, doesn't communicate uh, in, in the back office, that people still have you know, their own system as opposed to a fully integrated system. We went through a horrendous situation a bunch of years back uh, uh, trying to get uh, interoperability communications for police and fire. Uh, they, the two departments literally had different technologies for their uh, handheld radios. Uh, and there was a fight, almost a physical fight at one point, uh, between uh, some leaders of the different departments about which, which private sector company was going to supply that technology uh, to the city of Philadelphia. And for something so critically important, I mean, it's kind of absurd at, at, a, at a certain level. And so, you know, we talk about big data a lot, but we and governments collect a ton of data. We're probably still not capturing all that we should, and even when we do, we're not exactly sure what to do with it. Uh, so how do you best utilize it uh, for citizens? That right. would be a part of the dream. That, I think you have thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of foundational practices also. It's not just about the technology. It's about the routines that you build in your government. And I think one of the things that we're, we're more apt to actually buy technology than we are to actually think about and to resource governance, to resource kind of the routines that you need to have built in City Hall and at set in central pockets in your, in your government around the practice of using data. And so what happens is problems will come up at the program level and it'll be scoped and, it, and technology will be procured and a solution will be deployed and it will happen completely in a silo, just replicating the same silos that government has sort of been built on. And until we start to value data differently and think of it as a strategic asset and think about it as sort of a fundamental centralized platform that we should be using as an operating system for government, then we will continue to just buy technology and invest in specific solutions that don't have um, a enterprise-wide application that makes it difficult for us to use the data, it makes it difficult for us to share the data, it makes it difficult for us to drive decisions using data, and until we start to build those routines and build the, and, and really create the value proposition, then it's going to be very difficult for technology, modernization, um, AI, all of the sort of buzzwords that we hear about in government, we'll never be able to do that unless we have that sort of pivot change and we start to think about data as that sort of strategic asset. Um, I'm sorry, I, I think that before we start thinking about data, we have to start thinking about people. Um, you know, we can, we can spend all the money to get the latest hardware and software. That's not the point. First of all, government does not have the ability to stay up with the rapidly advancing computer technology stuff that private business with a profit motive and a profit line and investment does. So that's one thing. But you can get a lot more out of data if you start asking for a lot more out of your people. And you talked about silos. That's absolutely true. But if you allow silos to exist, they're going to stay in silos. So when we start, and, and the data has to be integrated both vertically and horizontally. When we bring our data together, we bring it together based on a large part about what our citizens say are their priorities. We organize our approach to solving those problems 
without regards to just bringing in public works or just bringing in the police department or just bringing in the health department. We bring, we solve our problems with our citizens by focusing on the goals of the council committees that I appoint. So neighborhoods and public safety, as the neighborhood uh, uh, department has housing, has animal control, has EMTs, it has the fire department, it has the police department, it has the health department, and there's somebody that I'm missing, but they're all there. And by bringing all the people together from different silos to work outside of the silos, you tear down the silos, you emphasize the value of cross-departmental effort, you show the data is improving the results that you get, and let them buy into it. Now, you also have to do it very specially. You can never use that type of an approach as a way of punishing or embarrassing somebody inside your government. They'll never do it. We have to create an atmosphere inside government that it's okay to try and fail. Because if it's not okay to try and fail, you're never going to try. We want our people trying. Because they're the ones, quite frankly, that are best able to say this data tells me something and based on the fact that I actually do this job day after day, I can make a suggestion how we can do it better. And we've seen a lot of that. Start with the people. Make sure that the people understand that working together brings benefits to them. Create different teams. They still work in a department, but don't analyze things department by department. Analyze it by goal and job and issue. I think that's a great point. I worked in New York City government, and to be honest, it was my favorite job, and I worked with the best people um, that I probably worked with in, in any place. Um, including where I work now, because I work with amazing people. Um, but I think that the talent and the passion that you get from people that work in city government is just unmatched. And so Beth, as you think about you know, now having worked with over 100 cities globally, um, and the work being so focused on people, I'd love your thoughts on what do we need to do better around empowering and upskilling um, staff in city government so they can drive the conversation. I think some of the challenge we have is that often it feels like the technology or the technology companies are driving the conversation versus more meaningfully engaging city staff in it. Well, I think one thing is, you know, around, but around 2007, 2008, when the economy started to really tank, there was this like big running narrative in government that we were gonna be able to attract millennials into government jobs and they were gonna come in and they were gonna save the day and they were gonna build applications and they were gonna help us solve problems differently. And the reality of the situation is that really never materialized. We got we, we were able to attract some folks to come in, but they didn't stay very long, or there are they aren't staying very long. And we, what we did at the same time is we cut back all of the incentive programs. We cut back training. We cut back public sector investment programs, education programs. And so the first thing is I couldn't agree more with uh, Mayor James is that we need to start reinvesting in public sector workforces. We need to start building a bench of tech people who can think technically and who can understand the value of data, but that have already answered the call and committed to a life of public service. That have already said, I'm going to work in this city. I've been here for 10 years. I've already said, like, I've already demonstrated a commitment to it. And then we need to nourish them with skills. You know, sometimes all it takes is to show a social worker how to make a pivot table, and they can totally redistribute the caseloads in their departments. And they just need these, these skills that are not baked into their programs when they're coming in from a program perspective, but we can really make them big data advocates, big data stewards, and be thinking really positively about how they can do it. So foundationally, I think one of the most important things that we can be doing is reinvesting in the public sector workforce and building skills out of the public, building, you know, bringing those skills to those people that have already sort of answered that call. And then it's about investing in the foundational practices. It's, it's, it, I couldn't agree more, it is about the people. People need to understand that there are routines that are required. You need to start thinking about um, data, how to scope your problems that elicit some of, of the more uh, uh, cutting edge interventions. But if you don't have those skills, if your people aren't skilled enough to be able to scope a problem that elicits the right solution, then you'll end up getting a mismatch between the solutions that are being spun up and the actual problems that people are facing when they're trying to do frontline work delivery. So we talk about knowing what you know, 
creating inventories of both data and systems, thinking about governance. These are not sexy things, but these are the things that get you where you need to go. And then you need strong leaders who create the space that give the opportunity for frontline, mid-level managers to take risks, to think differently about the way that they're doing their work. And then you, you get you know, mayors that are leading KC stat meetings that are really like pushing the envelope, asking, demanding people to think more boldly about their problem solving, and they get to the point where they actually um, are making big, effective, high-level change. Oh. Yeah, um, that has really kind of triggered a thought here. Um, I mean, I do still have them from time to time. Um, you know, everything you just, I mean, one, I agree with everything you just said. The Smart Cities Conference, um, a lot of technology people, a lot of private sector people, and probably most of the public sector folks here are probably mayors or former mayors. I know there are a lot of CTOs, CIOs, that, those types. But there are entire workforces in the government who have to deal with increasingly what often are referred to lovingly as the disruptive economy, the disruptive companies. I just came from the, you know, talking about the autonomous vehicles, we've got 5G, we've got, I mean, you know, I could run down a laundry list and probably get in trouble naming companies, especially ones that I work with, but that's not the point. Public employees are then faced with trying to deal with these companies that they may, one, have no idea what they really do. Two, worse, there are no rules and regulations for virtually any of them. So bike share shows up, shared vehicles, shared housing, you know, you want 3G, you want 4G, you want 5G, you want 8G, whatever that is, and, and all of that technology, because you need it on the ground and above the sky. There are virtually no rules and regulations for any of this stuff. So the industry is driving change. The government is trying to react to it. What, whoa, what is this? Is it safe? Should we be doing it? Should we charge for it? How much? Oh, you want to be in a public right of way? I mean, all of these issues continue to come up and we're expecting folks who have been doing whatever they've been doing for a long period of time, you show up at the desk, I need a permit for X, Y, Z, and they say that is not even listed in our code. Why are you with me? you need to go over there. Of course, when they go over there, they send them somewhere else. Tremendously frustrating. And so we need to make sure, actually, that public employees have more opportunity to come to conferences like this to see what is really going on kind of in the rest of the world and that this is your world. It's coming. You can frustrate it. You can slow it down. You can try to ignore it. It is coming, and we need to try to really get out in front of it. That's great. Thank you. you want to uh, I, I, I think there's a, the, I sometimes find it really interesting that when we think about getting feedback, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about mechanisms to get feedback from residents, but less time thinking about how to get feedback from uh, our employees. Uh, even when we think about, like I always thought it was interesting when we would build tools, um, the idea of a on the ground sort of uh, city employee, whether it's a police officer or a firefighter or a garbage, uh, sanitation worker uh, or a teacher, whoever, they're seeing things, they're trusted, there's all these reasons that we should be treating information that they can gather and provide, just for the sake of the fact that they're engaged and care about the city uh, uh, as, as first class information, right? And it could be things like, hey, I'm seeing permits that don't, requests for permits that don't exist. Uh, I'm seeing potholes on the street. I'm seeing graffiti outside my school. Um, we expect them to just go the same exact route as, you know, John or Jane Q Public as opposed to trying to build more tools to get them, to give them the ability to provide information. And even thinking about incentives and ways to actually get them excited about participating, it doesn't have to be monetary, but ways to actually drive uh, the folks in the city that are already there, that are on the ground, that we know we can trust, to give them the ability to give us more information about what's happening in a uh, tighter way. Mayor James, you're, I think, an expert in engaging both residents and your staff on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, and so maybe you can talk a little bit about how you think about sort of engage, direct engagement with your community and what you've learned along the way. And maybe a couple of great examples. Well, one thing I've learned along the way is to stay off of Twitter after more than two scotches. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. <Yeah. laughs> 
you know, it can be fun until the next day when your chief of staff says, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> um, I had a guy that was laying into us about something, totally had no idea of what he was talking about uh, just not too long ago. And, and I really wanted to blast him, but I decided on a very basic response like, isn't it a little early for day drinking? Um, <laughs> that was the restrained response? That was, a, that, oh yeah, that was a restrained response. Uh, but look, I, I love Twitter. Uh, and, and frankly, I think the people that I engage with on Twitter who follow me on Twitter, it's about 140,000 of them now, they like it too because I don't, I'm not there just to say, oh, if you, uh, there's a meeting at 3 o'clock on Saturday. We talk about the ball games. We talk about what's going on. We show what we're doing with schools. We highlight people's causes. We do things that engage in a conversation about whatever the subject may be. There are some subjects I choose to ignore. I, I'm much better with dealing with trolls than I used to be. I am. I, I'm not perfect, but I've got 15 months left, and I think I'm going to start sliding more towards being less perfect. <laughs> There's a lot of things I want to say to a lot of people. I'm so glad I Last you. day, Twitter might be my last day on earth. <laughs> but, Go for it. but the bottom line is, every way that we can find to communicate with our constituents, our people in our city, is a good thing. I know Michael Nutter. I've been around him for a long time. I consider him to be a mentor. One thing I know about him, and something I've done myself, we're out. We're always out. We're always accessible. People love that. When you start building that rapport and people thinking that, oh, you're, I had a lady stop me in the grocery store once and said, she was shocked. You do your own shopping? I said, I do my own eating. I have to do my own shopping. You know, but people have this idea that when you're in these elected positions that somehow you're in a different place. We're not. We're just regular people doing a really neat job. But to have a conversation where you feel comfortable weighing in on anything, uh, whether it's informative or casual or sports related or here's a tragedy, let's do something about this or a call to action, creates that kind of competent uh, trust that when we ask our citizens to do something, we're not starting at ground zero. It's another tool. I also think that social media is perhaps one of the worst things that was ever invented, where people will get on there and they will say whatever the heck they want to anybody and without any remorse whatsoever. And, or in a lot of instances, they say something they think is funny, the recipient did because you can't see the facial expressions, all that. But it's a tool, just like technology is a tool. All of these things are tools. This is not the end of what we're doing. This is a means to do what we need to do more effectively, more efficiently, and, and at better delivery services for our, for our city and our clients. So Mayor Nutter, we're talking a little bit about using these tools to improve two-way dialogues. Um, clearly there are still people being left out of the conversation. Can you talk a little bit about that and what we can do to remedy that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I mean, everyone, uh, although everyone here really should follow Mayor Sly James, uh, it is quite, uh, quite, quite the entertainment. Um, you know a lot more about Kansas City. Um, but everyone is not on that uh, particular platform. A and um, our, my, our uh, former director of communications, uh, Desiree Peter Cabell, is here. And I mean, we had a full social media, traditional media plan for how to try to communicate with our citizens using every possible platform and some other creative ways from time to time to really get the word out. People are not sitting around the TV waiting for the one, one of the three news stations uh, at 630 or waiting for Walter Cronkite to tell them you know, the truth of what the world is about. The young people are now all Googling Walter Cronkite. Who was that? Um, he was not on CNN. Um, and, and so um, you know, everyone is not reading the newspaper or, you know, and getting their news from, from that place. And so there is a lot of person-to-person -person, uh, engagement. And as the mayor said, Mayor James said, sometimes it really is you and physically being out 
uh, with people and in uh, communities, communicating across you know, cultural and language uh, challenges and barriers. Uh, you know, we benefited greatly from immigrant population uh, increase, but we also made sure that our 311 system could communicate in 150 languages uh, through a partnership uh, with a company because we wanted people to be able to access uh, their city government. Uh, signed executive orders requiring any person in the city, regardless of their documentation, that they uh, were, uh, uh, departments were required to provide them service. Uh, it's not our job to go check in people's papers as to, you know, how'd you get here or whatever the case uh, may be. And so, you know, but again, from a technology standpoint, you know, the various companies will come. The question is, where is it being deployed? What's the plan uh, for whether it's broadband or again, you know, whichever G, uh, you know, we're talking about, is it just a central business district? Is it just where, you know, folks who have means uh, are, uh, are living. We talk about uh, bike share programs, you know, is it just uh, in a certain area or is it out in neighborhoods and is there equity uh, about uh, people's, uh, an individual's ability to access services and programs? Well, on the government side, uh, we have, I think, some ability, we certainly have a right uh, to say to the companies, here's the city, we understand you want to target these areas, but if you want to deal with us, we want to see activity over in this sector and that sector and build them out pretty much at the same time. You have to do that. Otherwise, it, you know, it, it may happen over time, but it'll be slow. Yeah. Just one real quick thing. Yeah. Before you leave here, as you stand up or even as you sit here now, look around the room and ask yourself who's not here and then ask yourself why aren't they here and then ask yourself, what are we going to do about it? Because that's exactly what we have to do in our cities all the time. It's about equity. And these types of conferences could use a little more equity, to be real honest. Other thoughts? Yeah. Other thoughts on how we ensure these technologies are creating sort of more inclusive conversations, broadening the conversation before we move on? I, I, I think that the, I think to y'all's point, um, there's never gonna, there's never an easy answer to, to being. If it was easy, right? If it was automatic, then we wouldn't be having a conversation about inclusiveness. Um, and so I think that the, the big challenge is you have to make sure you're going to where people are, and not necessarily expecting them to come to you. And part of what destinations you pick to go, it can be a reflection of how you actually achieve that kind of equity. At the same time, I think one of the things that I um, think has to be taken into account is um, we shouldn't let imperfect um, imperfect information prevent us from getting information. I think sometimes when you think about things like social and new technologies or creating new platforms for people to access services, um, we use the fact that not necessarily everyone is going to access them as a reason to not do it at all. Uh, and I think that you want to actually do the opposite is to say, Let's go out and do this. Let's make sure that we're doing this online and making this available online. And then do the harder part to make sure that everyone can then get there, rather than the easy answer to just say, well, it's not fair, so let's not bother. Um, so, so I think that's really what it is. It's figuring out where people are and going and getting them and going to where they are, and then bringing everyone forward and leveraging all of these technologies in the interim so that you can start to build your fact base and user base in the process. Yeah, I think also, you have to be deliberate. It can't be, it will not happen if you are well-intentioned. You have to be incredibly um, meaningful. You have to be deliberate. You have to call it out. And you cannot use the same tools that you've been using because you will only hear the same voices you've been hearing. And you have to figure out where your disconnected communities are. You need to go to those communities and you need to use the tools that are most often used in those communities. And if you're not deliberate and if you don't purposefully do that, then you will continuously only hear the same voices. Um, people no longer go to websites to get information. They no longer, you know, town hall meetings are the same people that will show up to every town hall meeting. If you really want to do this work and you want to do it in a way that is inclusive, then you have to figure out what, how you got to the point where you have disconnected communities. And then the only way to reconnect communities is to go out there and use the tools of those communities to make sure that you're reaching those people. Could I just say that my rabbi uh, Bob Bennett, our Chief of Innovation Officers here. 
Um, and I, I, it's not that I love Bob, but he wears a bow tie, and bow tie brothers have to stick together. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. <laughs> this is the smartest man I know on, on smart, connected cities. Do you want to raise your hand, Bob, so everybody can come find you afterwards? Um, great. Well, so you've given some, I think, great advice to both folks on the city side and also those creating the technology. Um, any final thoughts on as you're talking to folks that are the entrepreneurs, the technology companies, the consulting companies thinking about how can we best support cities and really create a collaborative conversation? Um, any thoughts on how they should think about the work? You know, I say to folks now, you know, there is uh, life after public service and engaged in a variety of, uh, you know, partnerships and, and relationships. Um, I speak now multiple dialects of English. I speak a government, uh, linguistic, but also a private sector uh, dialect as well. And as we all know, often even though you're speaking the same language, you're really not talking to each other. And so part of what I do now is translate what that meeting was, what that conversation was, what that system was, and try to help people understand. I know what they said in the meeting, but actually they're not going to do that. I know what the company said, but they actually are not in that business. And so I want to encourage both sides to you know, just have a little less frustration with each other. Both are struggling, both are trying to communicate, uh, but you know, the government is designed to make sure that bad things don't happen uh, and that people don't get in trouble. You're trying to move along your technology, you've got investors, you've got you know, uh, shareholders, whatever the case may be, and so rapid deployment is what's driving your agenda each and every day. Governments are not necessarily designed for that. And so I just want to communicate to you that we're all in this together, we're trying to get some stuff done, uh, and better and more lower temperature communication uh, is actually going to get us where we need to get to. But it, for either side, it may take a little longer than you like, but you can have success on the other side. Great, that translation. Um, I think it's better to go well than to go fast. Uh, if you can find a way to monetize what you're doing in some way, that is always helpful. But I think it is absolutely imperative that you push out information to the people that you're serving as to what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how success will be measured. And I also think it's important that you say, you know what, we tried it, it didn't work. But we learned this, and we're going to take what we learned here, and we're going to put it over there, and it's going to make that better. So be honest and open. If we want our citizens to be open and honest with us, we've got to start the process. It's on us first. It's on them to respond to that. Uh, I, I actually think what's really exciting is, is thinking about how we, how we can use the sort of power of a city in terms of driving more equitable deployments of these different technologies. I think uh, there's tons of examples. I think the stuff that happened with Google Fiber in Kansas City is a great example. Uh, I think that we were doing some stuff around free Wi-Fi in New York where we said if you want to do something in Central Park, here are the other six parks that you need to go and provide free Wi-Fi for in the Bronx and in Queens and in other places that uh, aren't featured on, you know, Friends. Um, and I think that that's really powerful, particularly in the kind of gold rush, whatever you want to call it, around smart cities where um, something like, you know, 60% of the investment for a lot, a lot of these applications uh, can come from private sector money. And something like 55% of all smart cities applications that we just looked at at McKinsey for our upcoming smart cities report uh, can generate a positive financial return. And in that environment, then we need to think not only about how do we, as a city, get a piece of that, but how do we take our piece and use that to spread around the impact so that it's affecting the places that we care about as public sector executives, not just places that are going to generate the highest, fastest return for our company. Great, thank you. Um, Parting words, never underestimate uh, the supreme intelligence of subject matter expertise that exists in government. I think I see it happen on the public and private sector side all the time, uh, where we're not deferential to subject matter expertise and experience, and it is a fatal flaw in the approach uh, the public sector, the private sector takes oftentimes when they're engaging with government. And finally, I say hire more smart women. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Um, thank you guys so much. A lot of progress and a lot of work to do. Um, thanks everybody for joining us and thank you to the great panel.